I will start by just giving you a quick verse, uh, a rap verse. So I know that's not traditional in these spaces, but why not? Um, so I sit in the back of the science class unconscious because everything that my teacher's spitting is nonsense. I want to raise my hand to avoid the conflict, but if I raise my hand, I'm not the one he's going to pick. So I sit there, mind in another place, rhyming to myself, different time, different space, displaced, we ain't at the same pace, can't wait for the bell so I can make my escape. And that rap was my interpretation of the experiences of a young man in a classroom in the Bronx who wanted to engage in the classroom and just could not find the opportunity to do so given the stifling structures of the classroom. So that bothered me a lot and it really informs my work and it brings me to this space where I realize that in this era we have in education, there's this really, really blind association between teaching and learning and peace, equity, and justice. We think that if someone is in the world of education or the field of education, that their work lends itself to being someone who sort of pushes forth these ideas, who supports these ideas. I mean, after all, we, we've all seen the images of, you know, a white middle-class teacher in an inner-city school, sort of covered down over the students and, and looking at them in their eyes, and they're looking back and they're reciting their alphabets. That moment, that space just looks like it's moving towards peace, equity, and justice. It makes us happy. And in the world of education, there are a bunch of really transformative and powerful words. I actually just used one, transformative. These words that, that, that become littered across the educational landscape. So we say things like transformative, uh, powerful, uh, uh, multicultural, progressive, um, focusing on equity. We use all these terms to describe the little practices that occur in classrooms every day because in some way, by using those powerful words, we can sort of let people believe that we are moving towards peace and justice. But what's happened is, because we've used those words so often, and they've become part and parcel of our discourse, and they've become really just part of the academic lexicon, the power that those words have have been lost. An idea like multicultural, that can mean bringing all sorts of cultures in the classroom, have kids express their voices and their opinions, depending on what their backgrounds are, has become, you know, have everybody's flag represented. So powerful terms and ideas, because we use them so often, has ruined what they can really do, has ruined the opportunity for them to push us towards peace and justice. And when I talk about peace and justice, I'm also going to trouble things a bit. I'm going to talk about how in classrooms we don't see peace and justice. And the fact that we can't ever get to peace and justice if we present those ideas peacefully. That in order to attain peace and justice, it takes pushing forth an energy that is actually sort of powerful and shaking things up. We can't have peace and justice in education if we use those words when just a few days ago, we were talking about Trayvon Martin, who was shot because he was black and wearing a hoodie. And weeks before that, we had an issue of a teacher in a school with slavery math problems in 2012. And the idea is that we cannot say that the images we present in classrooms of peace and justice because they look nice, or the words we use to describe what goes on in classrooms because they sound good, mean anything if we don't create a space where those issues outside of the classroom are brought inside of the classroom where we provide opportunities for youth to be able to engage in discourse and develop critical thinking about how they are part and parcel of an oppressive process outside of the classroom world and how that impacts how they are in the classroom, the selves that they express in the classroom. We have in education this, this, um, this model, it's, it's almost like a, a Coney 2012 model of how we recruit teachers. Right, to recruit teachers into urban classrooms or to recruit teachers into places where that's populated by black and brown youth, you have to sort of strike at their emotion. You have to say, listen, these kids have an oppressive life. You know, there are gunshots every day. Look at the statistics about how, how well they're succeeding in classrooms. And, and you sort of sell this image of this is what you can do to help out these poor children. It's a dangerous minds model as well. It's like the Michelle Pfeiffer model, right? Well, we bring all these ideas out into the classroom to recruit teachers in the classroom and, and then the teachers get there. And what we do is we, 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 we sort of stir up all these internal feelings. We, we stir up for many teachers a white guilt, right? Because how can I be privileged and be on this Ivy League campus? How can I make a change in the world? How can I advocate for peace? Well, it will mean that I have to go out into those places and do something. 
And so you go into these places, it's almost equivalent to like carrying a boulder up a hill. You have this boulder of white guilt, a boulder of language surrounding peace and equity, and you take that boulder and you're carrying it up a hill and it's on your back, and you're carrying it up the hill, and up that hill is the students. And you get all the way up to the hill, you're tired because white guilt is tiresome, right? <laughs> you're tired because I want peace and justice and I haven't done anything about it my whole entire life. That, that's painful. And you're taking all these steps up the hill, up the hill, and you see the students at the top of the hill. And you're excited about the fact that I'm going to get to this hill and I'm going to dump all this white guilt off when I get to the top of that hill when the students are there. Right? So you climb all the way up and you get there and you have this boulder and the students are right there. And instead of just taking that boulder and tossing it off the hill, you're just so tired that you drop it. And you drop it right on the heads of the students that you want to save. And you crush them. You crush them because our words and our language and our discourse and our views of what teaching and learning is, they're just big images. And they by no means capture the, the, the complexity of the experiences of the youth that we say we want to save, that we want to provide peace and justice for. So why am I telling this quick story or making this analogy? I'm saying it because in that classroom, when we dump our guilt on them, we stifle them, they have no opportunity to express their own voice. Students in classrooms don't have an opportunity to talk about how they see themselves as Trayvon Martin. They have no opportunity to, to talk about the slavery math problems. They have no opportunity to talk about incarceration in their communities because we're too busy dropping our guilt on them. So how do we move beyond this? I'm not just here to trouble up the issue. How do we move beyond this? I, I think we move beyond this by, by really focusing on what equity means. And we fail to focus on that. Equity is not giving everybody the exact same thing. Equity is hearing somebody's voice about what they need and providing them with that. I've been part, actually, of a conversation where people are saying, you know, there's a technology divide. Let's give all the kids iPods. Let's give them all iPads. And, and that's great to give all the kids technology, but that's not equity. Equity is creating the opportunity for the young people in front of you to share with you what their ideas are about what it is that they need. It's kind of like you, you, you have a bunch of starving children in front of you, and you know that all those children in front of you are allergic to food. They're allergic to different types of food. If you give one kid peanuts, it's going to be terrible. You might lose them. If you give one kid bananas, you might lose them. And then you say, okay, fine, we have all this, we have all this food and fruit here that we can give these students, right? And then you say, all right, but I want to be equitable. So I have to give all the kids peanuts, because that'll make it equitable. And if you give all the kids peanuts, what happens? Somebody who's deathly allergic will die. You've not created the opportunity where you can ask them what it is that they want. You don't even know their allergies, because you're so concerned with guilt and words and ideas that you can't get the opportunity to hear their voice. So I am advocating for moving beyond uh, student-centered pedagogy and even transformative and powerful ideas like culturally relevant pedagogy, because those words have been used and misused and abused and co-opted and distorted. I'm arguing for reality pedagogy. And so what is reality pedagogy? Reality pedagogy is teaching and learning based on the reality of the student's experience. See, while student-centered pedagogy from Dewey and Piaget and culturally relevant pedagogy from Gloria Latz and Billings has such power and potential, it makes no sense if the teaching is based on what our perspectives is of what the culture is. I can't be culturally relevant if I'm teaching you based on what my perception is of your culture. I can't be student-centered if I say, this is what I think the student wants and needs, so let me give them that. And what happens is our guilt and our experiences and our words make us think that we know what they need. We think poverty. We think crime. And they see rainbows and sunsets. I've had students where, I actually went into the classroom and thought, you know what, let's, let's, let's give these kids some cameras to capture their experiences in the world outside of the classroom. And I expected certain things. I'm a science educator, so I, I thought they'd take pictures of, of, of rotting windows, and we could talk about weathering, and we, we could really talk about oxidation processes. I was like, they're going to show me all this terrible stuff, and then we're going to use that to, to turn them on to school and schooling. Well, guess what happened? We gave them the cameras, they came back, and we literally saw sunsets over the projects. We saw big brothers holding the little sister's hands, walking them to school. We saw the matriarchs in the community telling stories. We saw all these images of beautiful and powerful and exciting things, and that's how youth see their lives. 
but we come there to teach them thinking of it as oppressive. And that disconnect causes us not to be effective. So reality pedagogy has five C's. The first C is this idea of cogenerative dialogues. What are cogenerative dialogues? Simple. Co, together. Generative, we generate. Dialogues. I'm arguing that in every classroom, why don't we create an opportunity for the teacher to pick four students that represent different demographics in the classroom and engage with them outside of the classroom about what their experiences are about what's going on in the class with a goal of co-generating a plan of action for improving the class. So, for example, you're always yelling. I've heard this, actually. No, I never yell. No, you do. And when you do that, I don't want to learn anymore. Next time you're in that classroom, check that. And when I'm about to yell, I look around and those four faces are staring at me. And they realize that I've empowered them by allowing them to give me some critique of my instruction. And then I maneuver and change my instruction to not do what they found oppressive. Co-generative dialogue. Asking youth to co-generate ideas about improving instruction and giving them the opportunity to critique the instruction. So you're not teaching from your point of guilt, but you're teaching from their perspectives about what's powerful. That's the first C. The second C, this idea of co-teaching. We think of co-teaching as have, having one teacher in the classroom, and then you have the co-teacher who gets the coffee and makes the copies, <laughs> right? But, 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 but let's move that idea beyond that and say co-teaching as in letting you teach the class. Give a young person a homework assignment that is not answer questions 45, 1 through 4, multiple choice, but actually, here's the teacher's manual, here's a sample lesson plan, go home and write a lesson plan. Use your own examples, and then come back into the classroom and teach that lesson. And let the teacher sit where the student is, and a student be positioned where the teacher was, and let there be a different type of exchange. Let the students know that you understand that they are the expert in how to deliver the information to each other, and you are only the content expert. Give them the opportunity to have voice. Give them the opportunity to see how tough it is to be a teacher. But the idea here is to, to change the structure, to give them agency, because they will inform you on what the best practice is. That's the second C of co-teaching. The third C is this idea of cosmopolitanism, a broad philosophical tenet that sounds like a mouthful, but we're going to whittle it down to something really simple, which is interrogate the ways you communicate with each other outside the classroom and utilize them inside the classroom. What do I mean? If you, outside of the classroom, are using head nods and handshakes as a way to combine and connect to each other, this is part and parcel of gang culture that creates an anti-school identity. Why can't we use those same, school, those same structures and associate them with a pro-school identity? That when you score a question right, you can have a four-minute handshake if that's what you want to do. Or you can do the Dougie if that's what you like to do. <laughs> but that the forms of expression and celebration welcome the, the, the ways that youth engage and communicate outside of the classroom. The ways they have responsibility for each other outside of the classroom should be the same inside. When they work in groups, and we assign them to groups only for that two-minute activity, when outside of the classroom they ride the bus together, lift together, wake each other up in the morning, dwell together, why can't we create partnerships of students in classrooms that can travail the course of the academic year or all four years of high school, creating a pseudo-family for students who oftentimes have a broken family structure? The third C, cosmopolitanism. The fourth C, this idea of context. Context means a culturally relevant and responsive teacher has a perception of the culture of the student. But the reality is that experiences of students in the Bronx or Oakland or Johannesburg or, or Nairobi are all different. There are certain traditions that are the same, but they're distinct things, they're nuanced things about culture that are very different. So when we're talking about context, we're saying in the instruction, be hyper-focused on the immediate communities the students are from. You don't have to go and get the microscopes to the back of the class from the back of the class. You can name the back of the class a street corner in the community. Go to the corner of 183rd and Grand Concourse and pick up the microscopes. Go to Jane and Finch and pick up the textbooks. It's a seemingly superficial thing, but what it does for young people, it allows them to see that you're not imposing yourself on them. You're understanding that where they come from has value. When we talk about context, it also means not thinking of the academic space as a sanitized space. Context means who are the icons in the community? Is it the person who did that graffiti image? Is it the guy at the pizza store that knows everybody's name within a 12-block radius? If those people are powerful in the context of the community, then we cannot let them rest in the community. We must bring them into the school, have them be a part of the instruction, 
Have them be an example. Have them talk about the science and mathematics in their life worlds. Context. And the last C is content. Really? You're, you're a math and science educator and content is last? Yes, because we've put content first, we've dropped boulders on youth, and we've not gotten a chance to get them to actually connect. You cannot get to the content if you don't focus on the environment of the classroom. You can't focus on content if they don't have voice, if they don't have agency, if they don't have a stage, if they don't have a platform, if they don't see their life worlds outside of the classroom, inside of the classroom. If those things don't happen, content knowledge will not be developed. Few may get it, but we must realize that those who do get it become successful in spite of, not because of, our practices. In closing, when we talk about peace, and we talk about equity, and we talk about justice, we cannot have those things if students don't have an opportunity to have their voice heard. We cannot have those things if we are so laden with our guilt that we're, we're wondering about being responsive in every single moment based on a false perception of what the kids are. We can't have them if we don't know the communities. You can't have them if you don't walk those streets and understand where the youth are coming from. Thank you.